Okay, and we are now recording. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the 22nd in our series of Zoom lectures sponsored, sponsored by Congregation KINS. Uh, as I think you know, all of the speakers have a STEM related topic, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and of course we added medicine to the mix and uh, correlation with Torah. Our speakers today are going to be Becca Bacal, who you probably can see her image on the line here, uh, and Melissa Ramos, who will probably be joining us a little bit later. And their topic today is medically related. And that topic is, in fact, Jewish genetic disorders and carrier screening. Uh, just a little intro for our speakers. Rebecca Bacal is program manager of health education at the Sarnoff Center for Jewish Genetics. That's a division of the JUF right here in Chicago. She has earned a master's degree in public health from Yale University, and she has been with the Sarnoff Center since 2017. Melissa Ramos is a genetic counselor at Insight Medical Genetics and also at the Sarnoff Center. She has earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Western Toronto and a master's degree in genetic counseling from Northwestern University right here in Chicago. Uh, prior to joining the Sarnoff Center in 2019, Melissa was a prenatal genetic counselor at Loyola University Medical Center for five years. For some of you who are watching, you probably are aware that I've been working at Loyola uh, in Maywood for the last 38 years and I have not yet had the pleasure of meeting Melissa since our paths have never crossed. So looking forward to, uh, to doing that. Um, before we officially get started, as always, I will remind you that you will have two opportunities to ask questions. You may interrupt the speaker at any time by simply unmuting yourself and asking your question. And also at the completion of the presentation, I will give you another opportunity to um, ask questions. And now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Becca. Uh, ready to go. Great, thank you so much. Um, so as Dr. Garish mentioned, I'm Becca Bacall and I'm our program manager of health education. And Melissa has graciously agreed to join us on her lunch hour. She is going to be here to answer questions. If, if you ask questions that stump me, but she may need to eat or, um, you know, do some other things. So she might have her video turned off, but she, she's here. Um, great. So let me share my screen. Um, so while we were discussing this earlier, while I'm screen sharing, I can't see the chat. So um, just please do un unmute yourself if you have any questions uh, while we are while we're talking. So today we're here to talk about recessive Jewish genetic disorders, or I'm here to, to share about recessive Jewish genetic disorders and the screening that is available to help families that might be at risk. Um, and this includes families that have only some Jewish ancestry and also couples who have only one partner uh, who has Jewish ancestry. So this topic may be familiar to some of you, it may be new to others. Um, I just wanna note that this, is, this presentation is from a curriculum kit that the Sarnoff Center developed and released a version um, of this for free so that folks who wanna share about Jewish genetics in their communities can actually give a version of this presentation. So if you uh, ever wanted to tell your family and friends uh, why they need to know about Jewish genetic disorders, then you should feel empowered to do that. And I'm happy to help you uh, uh, access that presentation or, or talk about the details. Um, so, a little bit more about the Sarnoff Center. At the Sarnoff Center, uh, which as Dr. Karish mentioned is, and I hope I'm not pronouncing your name incorrectly. You're doing fine, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Um, is, functions as a program of the Jewish United Fund. Uh, we are an educational resource um, and our mission is really to create a healthier, more informed community by educating healthcare professionals, clergy, and really in particular, individuals of Jewish ancestry about genetic disorders, hereditary cancers, and the importance of genetic counseling and screening. So we offer education on these topics, including what we're discussing today, recessive Jewish genetic disorders. And next week, we'll be back. Uh, I'll be back to talk about hereditary cancers. 
and uh, also genetic counseling and testing. As you know, we have a genetic counselor on staff. So she is available, Melissa is available to help answer questions and help people to identify resources. And for people who are planning a family, we have a subsidized carrier screening program. So we will be talking more about that. Now, uh, genetic technologies, no surprise, they're becoming increasingly common. So each year, our access to genetic information and our ability to use that information for our health will improve. Now, I'm curious um, if folks have used the reactions uh, buttons before, and they usually, they show up, um, I'm not seeing them right now, but they'll show up on your toolbar. And I'm curious if folks have had genetic testing before. If you have ever had a genetic test and you're willing to share that, could you raise your hand using the reactions button um, or type, type it into the chat, just say yes. Looks like I see at least one person has a, had a genetic test and I know this is a could be a personal question. So uh, in some ways, this is kind of a surprise question actually. Uh, or trick question, because most of us will have taken a genetic test in our lifetime. Um, every baby that's been born in the US since the 1960s has had genetic testing as part of newborn screening. So it's actually routine for every baby to have genetic testing. Uh, of course, that's not everyone, but, uh, but most people um, uh, will have had that testing done if they haven't had any other genetic testing. So, uh, what we're going to talk about today, not primarily newborn screening, but I just think that's an interesting fact, um, is uh, Jewish genetics. So people often feel that talking about these topics is scary because they don't think there's anything that they can do. But I really want to emphasize that there are simple choices that folks can make to learn about their risks and really protect their family's health. So we will talk about that today. Less of a um, a Jewish learning Torah perspective, but if you have questions on that, you're welcome to ask them and I can try, try to get them answered even if I can't answer them. Uh, so first let's consider what, what do we mean when we say Jewish genetics? And to do that, we have to back up and review some biology. So when we talk about genetics, we are talking about heredity the process through which parents pass certain genes on to their children. And now our genes can be thought of as an instruction manual, directions that tell our bodies how to grow and develop. And every person gets half of their genes from one parent and half from the other. And these shape their traits, including physical characteristics and risk for genetic disorders. Now our genes are packaged into chromosomes, which is the object that looks like an X here is a chromosome. And most people have 23 copies of each chromosome. Uh, now, one of the 23 sets of chromosomes will determine sex. And typically, males will have one X and one Y chromosome, and females will have two X chromosomes, although not in all cases. Uh, now, when we think about genetic disorders, there are some genetic changes in our body that will influence our traits, like our hair and eye color, but they're not harmful but there are other genetic changes that can lead to disease. So a reminder here that we have two copies of each gene and um, the genetic disorders that we'll be talking about occur when specific genes are changed and not working. So when a change in just one copy of a pair of genes, a gene pair, causes a genetic condition, we call that condition dominant. And an example here, one that we'll talk about more next week is hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Now, when a condition only occurs if both copies of the gene pair are broken, so there's no functioning copies of the gene pair, then that condition is called recessive. And examples of recessive conditions include Tay-Sachs disease and cystic fibrosis. Now, a third type of genetic disorder called an X-linked disorder is caused by a changed gene on the X chromosome. And X-linked conditions mostly affect men. So uh, I've mentioned this because it will come up later in the presentation. But uh, one example of an X-linked disorder is fragile X. So uh, what about a genetic disorder makes it Jewish? Uh, we call some genetic disorders Jewish genetic disorders because they're more likely to occur 
in people of Jewish ancestry. Now the changes that cause these disorders are more common in people of Jewish ancestry than they are in the general population, sometimes up to a hundred times more common. Uh, but they're found in all populations actually. Uh, so uh, just a little more detail, uh, different genetic disorders will affect Ashkenazi Jews than Sephardi or Mizrahi Jews, but all of them have uh, unique risks. And, um, and some Jewish genetic disorders are very severe. So uh, just, just to emphasize this point, just because we call something a Jewish genetic disorder, that doesn't mean that only people who have Jewish ancestry can get it. In fact, anyone can be a carrier of anything. Um, so we see all of these mutations in all populations. It's just a question of the rate, how frequent they are. Now, because of screening programs in the Jewish community, oh, did I hear Sir Began have a question? Maybe not. Um, many more babies with certain Jewish genetic disorders are actually born to non-Jewish families than to Jewish families. So you see this sort of peculiar phenomenon where it's more likely that someone who's Jewish would, would have this disorder, but because we have screening, uh, it's actually less common to see babies born with certain disorders in the Jewish population than outside of it. Um, now, a little bit more background on, on how it came to be that folks with Jewish ancestry have these risks. Um, certain disorders tend to be more common among Jews due to something called the founder effect. And this is a population genetics principle. So it's believed that most of today's Ashkenazi Jews, and I'm going to focus on Ashkenazi Jews because we know more about the risks in that population, um, have descended from a group of only a few thousand individuals or founders uh, that lived 500 years ago in Eastern Europe. Now, most Jewish people in North America are Ashkenazi. And because historically Jews have married other Jews, today millions of people can trace their ancestry directly to this founder population. So even if just a few of these individuals or founders had a mutation, then that gene mutation would become frequent over time. So this chart illustrates the founder effect. And the orange color here represents a gene change that can cause disease. And the original population is on the left. And then due to a founder event, so an example of a founder event could be a disease, a geographic isolation, like everyone picked up and moved to an island, um, or social isolation, then the population decreased until there's only a few people left. And that's called the founder group in the middle. So when that group reproduced or reproduces, a gene change that was originally rare can become much more common as on the right. Now we're gonna focus specifically today on recessive genetic disorders. And as I mentioned before, when we think about recessive conditions, these are conditions where a change is required in both copies of the gene pair to cause the condition. So um, in order for someone to have two changed copies or two non-functioning copies of the gene, they inherit an abnormal copy from each parent. Now, when an individual only has a change in one copy of the gene and they have a working gene copy that's compensating for the, for the broken gene copy, they're called a carrier. And carriers generally have no signs or symptoms of a disease. But when a couple is carriers of the same disorder, so each of them has one broken copy and one functioning copy of the gene, the same gene, um, then they have a 25% or a one in four chance in every pregnancy to have a child that is affected. Um, so you can see in this chart, that's the child that has is all turquoise. Uh, a 50% chance that the child will be a carrier like his or her parents and a 25% chance that the child will inherit normal copies of the gene from both parents. So this is a roll of the dice with each pregnancy. Uh, uh, sometimes people think, if they're your first child is you know, affected, that means if you have subsequent children, they won't be. And that's not how uh, probability works when it comes to genetic inheritance. It's just every pregnancy is an independent risk. So what this means from a practical perspective is that many carriers don't have a family history of the disease and they don't know their carriers until they have children affected by a recessive disorder. 
because uh, these just don't always show up in terms of people um, having the disorder. So uh, I think this statistic is pretty striking. One in four people of Jewish ancestry will carry one of these Jewish genetic disorders. So there are a whole bunch of disorders that we consider Jewish genetic disorders. And if you looked at a room full of people, so for example, there's 14 of us, um, that means if there's 14 of us in this room and we all have Jewish ancestry, then you know three or four of us, if my math is correct, yes, would um, be carriers of something. So because it's common to be a carrier of something, even though each individual disorder is rare, it's really important to be aware of these issues, not just for couples that have Jewish ancestry, but for everyone even beyond. So a few more facts about carriers of recessive disorders. Uh, every person is estimated to have to be a carrier of six to eight genes that can produce disease. Um, you know, we have obviously thousands of gene pairs. And so uh, in each person, there are some errors or broken copies. Um, and carriers generally don't have symptoms of the disease. So you, you sort of have all of this within you, but you wouldn't know it. Um, necessarily because it doesn't, um, it doesn't show up in terms of sickness. And uh, most carriers don't have any family history of a genetic disorder. So I can't emphasize this point enough. Sometimes I feel like I'm saying it until I'm blue in the face. And the reason why is because people who do have a child with a disorder will often say, you know, we didn't know, we couldn't have known that this was a risk because we didn't know anyone in our family who had it. And that's typically what you would see. You would see that you know, no one has it until someone has it. Uh, so here's some examples of uh, recessive genetic disorders that are more common in the Jewish population. Now, all of these are rare conditions, but some of them are less rare than others. So I've highlighted um, some of the conditions that are more common in the people, in people of Jewish ancestry. So I'm curious if you've heard or wanted more of these diseases before, if you could um, use the reactions button to raise your hand or you know, otherwise signal that, that some of these might be familiar to you. I see some. So they might be new to some people. Great. Um, so the num I don't recall whether I mentioned this already, but the numbers in parentheses are the carrier frequency. So this means like um, how, uh, how many, one in how many people carry this mutation um, among people of Jewish ancestry. Now a little bit more about each of these disorders. Gaucher disease can be mild to severe and it can cause bruising, fatigue and anemia. Um, it is treatable. Tay-Sachs disease affects the nervous system and it's typically fatal in childhood with no treatment. Cystic fibrosis can cause the buildup of mucus and it affects the lungs, pancreas, and digestive system. And it is treatable but life limiting. Um, and familial dysautonomia affects the nervous system, causes developmental delays and is um, progressive and degenerative. So also life limiting. And Canavan disease affects the nervous system again and is typically in fatal, fatal in childhood with no treatment. So you can see there's a range. Some of these disorders are, um, are uh, there's really no treatment, no way to mitigate the effects. Um, some of them can be very mild. So there's, there's really a range. And uh, there are also recessive disorders that are more commonly seen in other ethnic groups. So uh, here are some examples of those. And there are other conditions that can affect individuals of all ethnicities equally. So this makes carrier screening um, important for everyone, not just for people with Jewish ancestry. Now, uh, I mentioned carrier screening, but I haven't really explained what it is. So we mentioned earlier that there are measures people can take if they may be at risk of having children with Jewish genetic disorders. And the main step that we recommend is called carrier screening. And many of you, if you have children, um, 
probably have already done carrier screening at some point in your life. But it looks very different now than it did if you had kids, you know, uh, 10, 20 or more years ago. So what is carrier screening? Carrier screening is genetic testing to identify those who are at risk of having a child with a genetic disorder, a recessive disorder. So to identify carriers. And carrier screening for a few conditions should be offered to everyone who is planning a family. Um, according to the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, that's their recommendation. Uh, and people of Jewish ancestry can pursue testing for Jewish genetic disorders in addition to the more basic screening that's recommended for everybody. So man, many carrier screening options today actually include conditions that are more common in Ashkenazi and Sephardi Jews, and also a variety of other recessive and X-linked conditions. And panels like this, or you know, genetic testing panels like this are called expanded carrier screening um, because it's you know, they're not just testing for a few conditions, it's, it's more expansive and it's becoming more common. So the goal of carrier screening here is really to provide individuals with information about reproductive risk. So sometimes I hear from people, you know, should I do this testing to find out about my own health risk or just because I'm curious? And we usually say, it's not gonna tell you that much about your own health risks. Um, or people will say, my I'm, I want to have grandkids. Should I do this testing so that my kids will know about their risk when they're starting their families? And we usually say the people who are going to have kids should just get the testing done because the information will be most accurate and useful in that context. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions about that. Now, uh, if a couple is both carriers for the same condition, um, they're called a carrier couple. And of course, uh, for people who are wanting to start a family, this can be a hard thing to find out. Um, but what I always want to make sure that people know is that carrier couples have a variety of options to build a healthy family. So sometimes people think that if we, if they do carrier screening, they both find out they're carriers for the same condition, that what we're gonna tell them is you shouldn't have kids together. and that is never, never what we say. Melissa can confirm. Um, the genetic counselor would not say, don't have kids together. They would just say, here are some options. You know, you can pursue a variety of options and you can build a healthy family. So uh, different couples will make different choices based on their circumstances, their values and their preferences. And there's really no one option that's right for everyone, but couples in this situation usually benefit from uh, talking about their options with genetic counselors and with other healthcare providers. So a little bit more detail about these options. You may be familiar with IVF or in vitro fertilization, um, which is where an egg and sperm are combined in a lab and then implanted to create a pregnancy. And so when you do this with a technology called pre-implantation genetic testing, uh, basically what you can do is look at the embryos that have been created and choose to only implant embryos that are not affected by that disease. So um, it's, a, it's a technology that's really coming into use more commonly now. Uh, and it's not just used for recessive disorders, but it, but it is also used for those. So uh, say that if you know that you have a risk of um, passing on Tay-Sachs, you can choose to do this, uh, to do IVF with PGT and only have embryos implanted that wouldn't develop Tay-Sachs. Um, another option is prenatal testing. So some people will um, choose to get pregnant and reminder, there's a one in four chance that each pregnancy can be affected by that disorder. So parents will conceive and then they can find out during pregnancy whether their pregnancy is affected and use that information to prepare and seek out resources if they plan to have the child or to um, choose not to continue the pregnancy. Other options that people choose include using donated sperm or eggs from a donor who's not a carrier for the disorder, uh, adopting and accepting the one in four risk. So if they know uh, that they, they sort of have the resources and support and they are prepared to have a child with that condition, then some people may choose to, um, to just accept that one in four chance. Now, 
I want to show you just some personal stories of couples who have actually been there and, and had to go through this decision-making process. And you will need to let me know if the video is not working for you. So it should, you should hear the audio shortly. We did premarital counseling with our rabbi and he suggested that we do genetic screening because there is a greater risk of people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent specifically of having a child with a genetic disorder. When I learned that I was a carrier for Fragile X, it was pretty scary. Um, I had never really been that familiar with the disorder before and it was just kind of marked as one of the ones on the results page that had a high, um, kind of a high risk outcome for a child that was born with the disorder. Kind of immediately we knew that we were going to do what we could to make sure that we didn't A, have a child that had fragile X or B, be a carrier themselves. So we kind of jumped right into figuring out how IVF with PGD, which once we started hearing what the options were, um, we pretty immediately realized that that was what was gonna be the best for our family. With our second child, when we found out it was a boy, we, we sought genetic counseling, which was a much better route to take than Googling for answers and trying to figure out what all of these different mutations could possibly mean. A genetic counselor really helped us focus in on what our potential issues could be and how to handle it and what our options were from there. We had the opportunity to make an informed decision discussing the percentages um, of our child being a carrier or actually expressing this disease. And Melissa and I talked about it and we thought it was best to go ahead with amniocentesis. Uh, I, I think resources like the Sarnoff Center are really useful for anyone who doesn't understand anything about genetics, which is probably 99% of us. Um, we learned a lot through the process and it made something that was pretty terrifying a lot less scary. I have to say it was a scary time. It really was a scary time. Um, we didn't think it would go this way. We thought you get married, you have pregnant, you have kids, and everything turns out A-OK. -okay. We were fortunate enough to have our genetic test and realize that we we're at risk for some premutations. Modern resources in modern medicine are so much more than most people even realize, including what we realized. And take advantage of it and do everything you can to have a healthy child and have a healthy life. We're so lucky. Yeah, we're lucky. We're blessed. We were blessed. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we have two wonderful, beautiful children. I wouldn't want it any other way. No. No. Nope. Love you. Love you. if I can get it to go to the next slide. Sometimes it will be a little funny about this. Okay. Give me one second. Okay. Sorry. Okay. One more second and then I will get back to the slide. Thanks for your patience. Okay. Uh oh. All right. Here we go. So, um, So both of those couples, you know, really had to had to make a decision about what to do when they found out they had a risk of having a child with a disorder. And one of the resources they used was genetic counselors. So a little bit more about genetic genetic counseling. Um, genetic counselors are professionals who are trained in clinical genetics and in psychosocial counseling, and uh, their goal is really to empower folks with information and um, 
help them understand, you know, what options they might have, both when it comes to genetic screening and testing. And then once they do the screening and testing, if they find out that they have a risk or uh, that there are implications to sort of help them along that path. So um, we're really lucky at the Cernoff Center to have Melissa, and she actually guides all of the couples that go through our carrier screening program. Um, so she's a fabulous resource. And then people often will call us to ask about other things, whether it's Jewish recessive disorders or hereditary cancers, um, or just they're looking for help. You know, it's, it's uh, sort of rare to have a genetic counselor that you can just call and speak with. Um, and uh, we're very lucky. So, oh, a little bit more about genetic counselors. They specialize in a variety of areas, including prenatal genetics, cancer, pediatrics, neurology, cardiology, and more. The field is really expanding. Now, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the history of carrier screening and how it started. Uh, so Tay-Sachs disease was actually the first illness for which carrier screening was offered widely in the Jewish community. Now, babies born with this recessive genetic disorder will appear normal at birth, but they stop reaching developmental milestones between three to six months, and they have an average life expectancy of around five years. It's not a treatable condition and it's not curable. And um, so it's pretty devastating, a pretty devastating illness. And around one in 30 Ashkenazi Jews is a carrier. Now this disease used to dramatically impact the Jewish community. Um, and that tragedy really led to the development of carrier screening for Tay-Sachs and led to widespread screening in the Jewish community. Uh, so this chart shows how Tay-Sachs diagnoses decreased after carrier screening started in the early 1970s. And this may, may be news to some of you, but not probably to all of you. Um, now, because of widespread screening in the Jewish population, it's actually rare today for babies of Jewish descent to be born with Tay-Sachs disease. Um, now this can be confusing, but carrier screening doesn't eliminate the risk of a disease in a population uh, because people will still have children who are carriers if they're a carrier. So the decreased number of Jewish Tay-Sachs births does not mean that the carrier frequency has decreased. Um, in fact, each generation is still at risk. Um, so sometimes I will hear from people that they know that their parent is a carrier, so they don't need to do carrier screening with their partner or that they know their parent isn't a carrier, so they don't need to do carrier screening but we recommend everyone do it before they have children because we're testing for more things now than we were before. Um, and the technology has changed and uh, really improved to the point where you know, they can detect mutations they couldn't detect before. And also in some cases, only one partner was screened. So for example, if my mom was screened and found out she wasn't a Tay-Sachs carrier, but my dad wasn't, I could have become a Tay-Sachs carrier through um, it being passed down from my dad. So just, just an explanation why, even though these are really encouraging numbers to look at, uh, it's still important in every generation to do carrier screening. Now, um, we often connect with families at the Saranoff Center that are interfaith or that don't have any Jewish ancestry. And it's important to remember that all populations face genetic health concerns. So this is not just an issue that people of Jewish ancestry face. Um, now, for example, people of African descent are more likely to get sickle cell anemia and Tay-Sachs also runs in the French Canadian population in addition to people of Jewish ancestry. So even if you don't personally have Jewish genetics, it's still useful to consider genetics when thinking about um, a family's health, your family's health. And also that genetic disorders that we call Jewish genetic disorders don't only affect people who have Jewish ancestry. So these issues are still really relevant to interfaith couples and also to families that don't have any Jewish ancestry. Um, now a little bit more about screening. If you are planning for a family or if you know someone who is, then you may wanna seek out carrier screening. And couples who screen before pregnancy have the most options, but screening during pregnancy is also an option. Uh, so there are national and local options for community-based screening that is affordable, 
and accessible. And you can also speak to your healthcare provider. Um, now, insurance coverage for expanded carrier screening does vary, which is why these uh, community-based screening resources are so useful. Um, so just here's some more details on who is a good candidate for carrier screening uh, and when is the best time for carrier screening and where you can access it. So um, all of this is sort of a review of what we've talked about. Best time is before pregnancy. It's really designed for people who are planning on having children. And you can access this testing through a healthcare provider, a genetic counselor, or other community resources. Now, uh, here's a list of carrier screening community resources. So for folks living in Illinois, like um, I presume most of you, if not all of you, the Sarnoff Center is a great resource. But if you have uh, family members or friends that are living in other states seeking carrier screening, they should be able to access it through one of these resources if they, um, if they want. Now, the testing process can really vary depending on a number of factors. Uh, it can involve a saliva sample or a blood draw. You can go to a clinic in person or receive education over the phone or online. And, um, and uh, each of these organizations, if you search their names, uh, you'll find the websites and they'll explain how their process works. So at the Sarnoff Center, we have a saliva-based test for most folks and they could do it all from the comfort of their home. So they sign up online with us and uh, do an online education course, fill out a medical form uh, about their, their family history. And then um, our partner, Insight Medical Genetics, where Melissa also works, um, will send them a saliva collection kit. They spit in a tube, send it back, and then that um, gets analyzed and they get their test results over the phone from Melissa. So even before telemedicine was so widespread, we were doing it. Um, now that's all the information I have for you today. Um, happy to answer any questions and I know Melissa is as well. Um, we do have a survey at participant-eval.questionpro.com and if you're able, I'd really appreciate any feedback um, that you could give us filling out that short survey. And happy to take questions. Anyone have a question? <clears throat> Actually, I have a question. I, I would like to address it to Melissa. I'm thinking that for people my age, we senior citizens, if we have uh, a, a set of grandparents, let's say my wife and myself, and let's say we are both tested for 10 genetic Jewish diseases, and we are negative for all of them. Is that a guarantee that our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-grandchildren would never come down with any of those diseases? That's a great question and actually a common question. And the answer to that is it is not a guarantee, right? So when we think of genetics, it's always evolving, whether we like it or not. And so we have to keep up with how technology continues to change as well as the discoveries of what we know of each condition. So in the past, for example, testing for 10 conditions may have been the most current type of testing at that time, but it maybe only had a detection rate of maybe 60% or 40% for that condition. Whereas now we're getting closer to 90 to 99% detection for these conditions. A good example is cystic fibrosis. Okay, this is a lung disorder that Becca had mentioned during the presentation and it's a condition where um, we now know there's closer to 2,000 different mutations or gene changes that can be associated with that disease. In the past, carrier screening only looked at maybe 23 mutations, or I think um, at one point when I was still at Loyola, you know, going back to that connection, there were some panels that only had 32 mutations or 83 mutations, but not even close to what is still a variable. Um, still out there, right? So I have actually had a lot of couples go through our carrier screening program where they said their parents were tested for cystic fibrosis, but then they come up as a carrier for maybe a milder variant that has just been recently identified. And it can change what it can mean for their children. You know, it doesn't have to be the classic type of cystic fibrosis anymore. It could be um, some milder disease or maybe their children 
may not even be affected. Maybe it's just completely asymptomatic, but it's a gene change that you may carry and can get passed on to future generations. So that's why, like Becca was saying, that's a big part of our um, messaging is that, yeah, carrier screening used to be called the one and done test, but it's not really like that anymore. Um, it continues to change and this information will be very different for your grandchildren and great grandchildren. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much. I see a question uh, in the chat, I'm oh, sorry. There, there's uh, something in the chat room from Evie and from uh, Shelley. Um, yes, I'm happy to, to start answering those and Melissa can add on. Um, so the question from Eddie and Shelley is, uh, what is the incidence of various cancers and their prevalence within the Jewish population? And I can say, we're gonna talk about this more next week. So come back next week. But in short, they're um, in the same way that certain disorders are more common, um, certain recessive conditions are more common because of the founder effect. There are certain genetic mutations that can cause cancer. Um, in particular, we talk a lot about breast cancer but there are other cancers as well, like ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, um, melanoma, um, prostate cancer, men's breast cancer, and more that can be tied to these genetic mutations. From my understanding, but Melissa, please correct me if I'm wrong, the overall incidence and prevalence of cancer within the Jewish community is not actually higher than um, as a result of this. Which is, which is really complicated, but the incidence and prevalence of these cancers that are caused by hereditary genetic mutations is higher in the Jewish community. Um, and, and yeah, Mel, anything you wanna add there? Just as a, a, little, um, a, a little teaser for next week, when we do talk about um, Jewish cancers, we're also talking about again, those mutations, what we would call founder mutations that are more likely to be seen in individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Um, and so that's where you can see that incidence or that risk be higher in the way that um, carrier frequencies can be higher in certain ethnicities for these recessive disorders that we just talked about. So we'll really focus on that, but I agree with Becca that overall, um, you know, the incidence of cancer is fairly similar among individuals. It just depends on the types of hereditary cancers that we're talking about. So going into the nitty gritty of that. Thanks. And then the second question um, is that our list, it's about Dory Shoram. So um, yes, we are familiar with Dory Shoram. Uh, for anyone who is not, um, it is a type of carrier screening it's a different model than carrier screening uh, through the Sarnoff Center or through most genetic testing resources. And um, the main reason why is because someone who goes through carrier screening by Doria Sharm doesn't actually find out if they're a carrier. So they wouldn't get their test results. So usually when we do medical testing, we expect that someone will call us and tell us like, you, you are or you aren't, you have this or you don't. Um, with Doria Shoram, it's all um, anonymous. Well, it's not actually anonymous, but it's all confidential in the sense that it's sort of blinded. And the goal here is for people who are looking to marry as a result of a matchmaking process so that they can sort of check whether two people are both carriers before they decide to go ahead with the match um, without letting anyone uh, know about their carrier status. So it was originally designed because finding out that you were a carrier of a disorder was stigmatizing and there was stigma around it. And the idea was that we could sort of remove the stigma while reducing the risk. And that works well in communities where folks uh, are going through a matchmaking process like this and there's a lot of stigma. Um, we find that a lot of the people who seek carrier screening through us and through other community resources like ours, um, they, there isn't as much stigma around being a carrier for those folks. And the fact that they know that there's interventions, there's reproductive options for them, makes them feel more empowered. So just sort of two different ways to think about going through this process. Good. Well, yeah. that, hmm? Any other questions or comments? Please? Yeah, what kind of incidence of uh, false positives uh, or for that matter, false negatives are there in 
doing these testings? I'll, I'll let Melissa answer that one. Uh, so it does depend on the condition. Um, false negatives, um, there definitely um, is a possibility just because Again, we haven't identified every gene mutation that's out there for each condition. We're still discovering more. Um, for false pe positives, it's less likely to occur just because again, we're looking for very specific mutations and the technology involved, which what we use is called sequencing. If anyone's familiar, it's basically an idea of um, if you have that, the gene, which is like a string of the DNA, we're reading through that gene and trying to see if there's any missteps or um, changes that can be associated with the disease. So um, false positives and false negatives definitely occur. Um, in terms of the numbers, I don't have those exact risks for you, unfortunately, because it does vary for each condition. But I think the biggest takeaway from that question is especially the idea that if you get a negative carrier screen result, that your risk is not zero, which is also a very common question. What we also include on our post, um, post course quiz is we can never say a 0% chance just because we're still limited in the technology that we have. Thank there's, you. Um, there's one more question in the chat room. Is there a higher incidence of essential tremor or will you address that also next week? I'm not familiar with essential tremor, but um, Melissa, do you? I, I can speak a little to it. I don't have an exact number. Um, just because essential tremors we can still consider as multifactorial, so genetic and environmental factors playing a role. So it's difficult to really pinpoint um, a very exact um, um, excuse me, risk involved. Um, there is one condition that we've already mentioned briefly during the presentation called Fragile X syndrome, which is one of the genetic causes for tremor. So Fragile X is one of the more complicated conditions on the panel where First, it's called X-linked, um, like they mentioned and that Becca mentioned, where it's a change on the X chromosome. Females often have that other X chromosome to overcompensate or back it up. So females may have um, no symptoms or maybe milder symptoms of the condition, but there's actually different categories of carriers as well. So there are cat um, certain carriers that wouldn't have any symptoms at all. And then there's carriers called premutation carriers that can also have an increased risk for tremors or an ataxia syndrome later in life. So that can also um, be information that we learn from the panel that can sometimes catch people off guard and this idea of what we call a carrier phenotype. So the chance of um, impacting you as a carrier, even if you do not have the condition yourself. And that is definitely part of the pre-counseling as well and what we do um, at the Sarnoff Center as well as uh, as a genetic counselor. Um, it's really important for people to identify what they could find out from this testing just because it can be a lot of information. Okay, any other questions from anyone? <clears throat> if not, I would like to give a very special thanks to both of these ladies, to Rebecca and Melissa for an excellent very informative presentation today. We appreciate your expertise. And I would like to remind our audience that the next STEM lecture will be one week from today. Please note that it will start at one o'clock and not 12 o'clock. The speakers will again be Becca and Melissa. And the topic will be what's Jewish about hereditary cancer, BRCA and beyond. At any point in time, if you want to know what's coming up at KINS, simply visit the website. There will be a link there describing the event. And uh, I think by now you all know that every one of these presentations is recorded and um, <clears throat> no later than tomorrow and more likely by tonight, the video will be available for reviewing on the KINS website. Thank you all for participating. Thank you to the ladies. And if you two ladies will stay on for just a moment after um, after everyone departs, I want to talk to you for just a moment. So thank you all for attending and hopefully we'll see you next week at one o'clock. Good questions from everybody. Yeah, I thought they were you handled them well. I thought there were some very, very good questions there. So uh, one of you mentioned, uh, it might have been you back up about the um, the breast pump on Shabbos. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that might be something that would be 
interesting to present in this series. So um, if you think it would be appropriate, you could send me perhaps the contact information and, uh, uh, and we can see if we can get a, good, a speaker for that topic. Sure, let me, um, I suspect there would probably be a fee associated with it, just to give you a heads up. Oh. Um, but it, it's actually, it's the, um, the teacher was Rabanit Leasarna and she used to work at ASBI. So it's possible there, you know, the connection could help. Um, here is, I'm putting in the chat her information. Oh, okay. If you do want to reach out to her. Um, it's sarna at drisha.org is her email. Uh, let's see, hold on one second. But I actually think. Oh, I see it, yes. I think okay. when she gave this lecture, it was, it was not, it was part of a different organization, but. Oh, is that someone who's in Israel or domestic? She is based in the U.S. in Pittsburgh right now. In Pittsburgh, okay. Very good. Okay, maybe we'll look into that. That might be interesting. Um, is there any other topic that either of you ladies might be interested in presenting at a later point in time? Uh, I don't think I want to run you three weeks in a row. Uh, that's hard on you and uh, the audience might like to see a different base. But uh, we, we have um, every Tuesday open after next week. I may have a speaker for the, si the 16th, I'm not sure yet. But if you can think of any topic that you think people would have interest in and interest in and you would like to present, uh, let me know. And uh, we can consider adding you to the uh, list. Also, uh, I'm going to send to you, Becca, a list of all of the previous presentations. And that list will have the dates and the speaker's name and the, and the topic. So if there's anything you want to want, go back on the video and watch, um, you'll have the date. It'll be easy to find it on the KINS website. And just so you'll know, the KINS website is KONGKINS, C-O-N-G-K-I-N-S dot org. You got a Great. thumbs up? Got a thumbs up from Rabbi Porish. So. Hi, Rabbi Porish. Uh, Right. Um, great, wonderful. Okay, we will, I'll think about it. We, you know, we have some additional presentations that we give, but there's like some overlap between them and the ones that we've already planned. So, okay. um, I some of the content is would be a little bit redundant. Okay, well that's fine. You'll uh, you'll think about it and get back to me. Okay, thank you both again very very much, and. Uh, See you next week. Thank you for having us. See you next week. Next week. And Thank we'll you. log on at 1250 next week, okay? Yes, sounds good. Okay, thanks again. I'm going to shut everything down. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.